through trip um, doesn't disappoint. Um, very, very nice little getaway. So if you're interested, um, you can ask any of the members here. Also check our um, Facebook page and our, our website. Um, but if you have any availability on July 20th, it, great to check it out. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone over to Erin um, Roethlisberger, and she's going to give you a little information about the things that are going on. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the community. It's great to see so many people out and some faces uh, from across the river as well. Um, I would just like to remind everybody who did make the trip from Wheeling that you can get a library card with us. Uh, wheeling residents, we have reciprocity with them, so um, if you're interested in visiting our library upstairs at some point, checking out books, get a library card with us. And those of you from Bel Air who don't have a library card, you can get library cards too. Uh, we have lots of great resources, both here and online. Um, so come and talk to me after the program if you don't have a library card. Uh, so again, Erica said this is the 12th year that we've been partnering with the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society to bring this program here, and we're always grateful for that. Um, so I'd like to give a round of applause for those people who, um, who plan this every year. It's a lot of work, and it's great to see everybody out here to support us. <laughs> so just a few quick announcements before we get started. Um, the back, for those of you who are new to the library, the bathrooms are just outside um, just the hallway to the left, and the women's room and the men's room are right there. Um, the programs this year are being live streamed, so if you can't make it to one, they are online. They're available to watch after the program, um, but they are live streamed as well. So you can, if you can't make it, you can watch it live, and then you can also um, watch the, the broadcast afterward. Online. That's on our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and then we put them up on the library's website as well. And then finally tonight, out of respect for our speaker, we do ask that everybody silence their cell phone at this time. Um, and just one, one more plug for the library. If you have children or grandchildren ages 3 to 5 or preschool, um, we have a great program here on Thursday and Fridays. Our, our Miss Bree does a story time and craft, and that is uh, Thursday evenings at 5 p.m. and Friday mornings at 10.30 a.m. That's our little bookworms program. And the brochures are on the back table along with the brochures for this Great Stone Viaduct Winter Lecture Series as well. Uh, I won't waste any more of your time. I'm going to introduce tonight's guest. He is a historical geographer and associate professor of geography at Ohio University. Much of his current research focuses on historical settlement geography in the United States, especially with regard to the historical production of regional cultural landscapes and identities. He's also inter interested in the historical settlement geography of Ohio during the national period, with an emphasis on sub-regional cultural trans landscape formation, which is a mouthful. Um, he also has a long-standing research interest involving the production of cultural landscapes associated with Germanic diasporas, especially in North America and Europe. Please welcome Timothy Anderson. Hope okay, everyone hear me? Good. Well, usually I uh, am speaking to a uh, class of like 250, so I'm skilled in uh, uh, projecting my voice. But uh, uh, so can everyone hear okay? We're good. Well, uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you to Dan uh, for the uh, gracious uh, uh, introduction and uh, invitation to come speak tonight. Um, so uh, this is, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, uh, really the second, or the chapter that I authored uh, in this book, Settling Ohio, which I co-edited with a uh, colleague in the Department of History at OU in Athens. Um, and uh, that book came out uh, last year. Um, does, uh, has anyone read uh, David McCullough's book, The Pioneers? Right? Is anyone familiar with that? Well, that book uh, came out in 2020, and uh, uh, David McCullough, yes? I mean, people are still having trouble seeing you. Want me to stick in one place? Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that good? Okay. I'll try not to move around. <laughs> Even closer, like around here. Okay, I'll do that. Are we 
That's all right, no problem at all. Now I'm even more nervous because I know it's live stream. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, uh, so so Dan Bacoa, who surprisingly the story and wrote the pioneers uh, in 2020, uh, and uh, that book is all about Marietta uh, and the settlement of Marietta and the Ohio Company of Associates that was influential in settling that. Um, and uh, Brian and I, uh, the, in 2021, we uh, were at a conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan, at the Midwestern History Association Conference. And, um, and the, the book, uh, David Rockwell's book, was all the kind of rage there. Everyone was talking about it. And what was interesting is that a lot of the historians that were there were not all that keen about the book. They had a lot of uh, criticisms about the book. Uh, and, uh, and so Ryan and I kind of thought about this, and, uh, and one of the criticisms was that um, uh, the book is fantastic, it's great, it's a, an amazing narrative, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, but really it was the history of only one group of people, right? That settled Ohio. Um, and I've been very interested for a long time in the early settlement of Ohio. I'm not a native of Ohio, I grew up in Oklahoma, uh, but my, I came to Ohio in 1996 when I got the job at uh, OU in Athens, um, and the place has become my home. And one of the things I realized for the very first time I came to Ohio uh, was that um, uh, Ohio has lots of different regional cultural landscapes. So within the boundaries of one state, I would say with the exception of Texas, Ohio has the most regional cultural landscapes of any state in the country. And you all know this as Ohioans, as Buckeyes, right? You go to Northeast Ohio, that's very different from uh, Southern Ohio. It's very different from Western Ohio, right? Each of these places kind of looks different, it feels different, it tastes different, it smells different. Um, and as a geographer, I'm very interested in this concept of landscape, right? The, the, the built environment, how human beings have uh, and alter the natural environments in which they live over time. And so, what I, uh, in my research, have, uh, have, 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 real, have realized is that uh, Ohio was settled by not just moonlighters. In fact, as you'll see tonight, moonlighters are really a small minority of the settlers in early Ohio. Rather, it was settled by lots of different ethnic cultural groups, and the current cultural landscapes of the state reflect that. So this book, uh, the impetus of this book was to tell these other stories and to bring some of these stories to life, beginning with um, the earliest inhabitants of Ohio, and that is the indigenous uh, populations. Uh, so the book, for example, starts out with chapter one written by David D. Richards, an anthropologist and archaeologist at OU, uh, and he is an expert on the Hoover and the Nina, and uh, uh, has a really good chapter about uh, those earliest, uh, 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 those earliest settlers of Ohio, and what we were interested in is this interplay, right, between Native Americans and uh, the earliest uh, Ohioans, the earliest Anglo-American settlers. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to um, let me, uh, let me go back there. Sorry, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to um, uh, uh, choose the cover of the book. Uh, and I chose this, I had seen this uh, some years ago in the Chicago uh, History Museum. Uh, and this is, uh, the, the painting actually does not have a title, um, but it usually is referred to as uh, Negotiations for the Treaty of Greenville. Right, and the Treaty of Greenville uh, uh, in 1795 uh, was a, uh, uh, a treaty between the federal government and uh, uh, Indian tribes in Ohio that ceded basically the northwestern two thirds of what's now Ohio to the federal government. And uh, this uh, uh, was negotiations uh, several months prior to uh, when the treaty was actually signed. Actually signed. Um, so I'm interested in, and what I want to talk about tonight uh, is, uh, is trying to think about um, how this happened. What are the larger scale processes in I love doing these talks because I get to interact with local historians, with local uh, folks. You all actually are the ones who know most about your local history. So I'm not, 
I, when I give these talks, I don't come um, pretending to know the intricate details of those. What I'm really interested in is uh, giving you maybe a larger narrative to think about um, when you are studying your own family history or local history. Um, and so that's what this talk is about, is uh, thinking about these kind of larger scale national and even international scale processes within which, or uh, yeah, the context within which uh, Ohio was uh, settled in the early national period, what historians call the early national period or the federal period, roughly between 1790 and 1850. So the title of my talk contains a couple of different terms. Uh, one is this idea of selective migration, and the other is this idea of genealogical geography. So when I say selective migration, I mean uh, this tendency for certain types of people to migrate. Uh, that is, um, oftentimes I think that we are, um, I don't know about your high school and grade school history, but I know that the idea that I was uh, given was that American, the history of the American West was this, um, this ever westward moving series of frontiers. Uh, and that it was kind of this wave, right, of, po of population that was going west. But I think what historians have, have shown uh, is that this actually occurred kind of in fits and starts. It wasn't this, this, this wave, it was rather kind of here and there and here and there. This place was settled here and then this place was settled here. And then maybe someplace back east was settled. Uh, uh, after a place that was settled further west. Um, so, um, and, and also when you look at who was doing the settling, it tended to be specific groups of people, and within groups of people, like different population groups, specific types of people. And that's what I mean by selective migration. Uh, and that selectivity might have been influenced by things like age and education, uh, social demographic uh, characteristics, that is certain people tend to migrate. So for example, in my research on German immigrants in the United States, about 7 million Germans immigrated to the United States between 1820 and 1921, settling mostly in the American Midwest, that those Germans came from really a pretty specific part of German society. It wasn't your everyday average German. It was people from a certain social economic uh, niche in German society. And that's what I mean by selective. That is, the migration process tended to select out certain types of people. This other term that I use, uh, genealogical geography, um, is refers to the use of family histories to analyze and reconstruct these migrations over time and space. And it's based on this basic tenet that individuals, all of us, everyone of you in this room, all of us are tied together in time and space through our biological connections back in time, right? Um, and this, this is true for every human being, but I think it's especially true for the United States because from the very beginning, the United States was an ethnically plural place, right? It received immigrants, migrants from all over the place, from Europe and within Europe, all different places in Europe, from West Africa, uh, and then later on, right, again from Europe, Asia, and this is ongoing, right? So this is a constant in American history, is immigration. Um, and so um, uh, this, 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 this idea of genealogical, genealogical geography is using um, these big databases that are now available in the millions or even billions of names. Uh, for example, the uh, FamilySearch.com database, the Mormon database, contains about a billion names. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Ancestry.com, I'm sure some of you are on Ancestry.com, right? So you know the types of records I'm talking about. With that, that is, these are ways now electronically that we can look at these very, very large numbers of people to try to reconstruct past migrations. And so um, uh, I've created this kind of model of settlement of the of, of North America. The way to read this, I know it's very convoluted, but the way to read this is from right to left. Right? So think of so this is both time and space. 
So uh, this is uh, this like minus one, minus two, minus three. That's past generations, and then these are future generations from a given place. So when I say a root place, that could be any place. That could be the land. That could be Athens. That could be any place where uh, 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 groups of people kind of congregate over time and space. Um, and, the, and, and we can trace that back through uh, uh, biological lineages uh, through past generations. So for example, uh, uh, if we were looking at this as North America, this would be like the East Coast, right? So uh, the East Coast uh, original settlement regions, New England, the Chesapeake Bay region, uh, the Carolina and Georgia, right? These early settlement regions. So each of those received immigrants from very specific places. For example, New England was settled mainly by people from East Anglia, not just not by your everyday average English person, but rather from this one place mainly, and that made all the difference. That's what I mean by selectivity, right? So the, the immigrants that settled New England, what made New England distinctive is that they came from a distinctive area in. Uh, in England, uh, that had a distinctive regional folk culture. Uh, and were Puritans, right? So Puritanism was introduced into New England, and that made uh, that, 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 and, and about the, the ways of uh, cooking, uh, the ways of building, uh, all these types of things. Um, uh, in the uh, Chesapeake Bay region, those immigrants mainly came from the south of England, which was, although in England, a very different part of England with a different folk culture and a different uh, different ways of food preparation, different ways of uh, uh, different socioeconomic strata, etc. Right, so that's what I mean by selective migration. And then over time, those folks move into the interior, right, in, and into these areas. I'm going to show you a series of maps that illustrates this for Ohio. But really, this can be done for any. Right, so that's just this root place, it's simply any place that there's this, mi this migration to. Uh, and then, in subsequent generations, a further migration. So, where to start? Well, if we look at this early settlement period, right, the period uh, when the first Anglo Americans, people of mainly English ancestry or European ancestry began settling across the Ohio River into what's now Ohio. Um, that was around 1790 or so. Um, and this federal era uh, between 1790 and 1850, I think is one of the most important eras in American history. This is when the old Northwest, the Northwest Territory, was being settled. And this is when lots of these groups of people from New England, from Pennsylvania, from Virginia, etc., were moving out of those areas and congregating in places like Ohio and southern Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and places like that. Um, and this is when a new um, uh, identity begins to form that is separate from this old Anglo identity, right? So in the colonial period, most Americans thought of themselves as transplanted English people, right? But once they begin to get out here into the interior, things start to change and new ideas start to form about what it is to be an American. Um, so during that period, if you look at the 1850 census, um, which was the first census to ask everyone enumerated, where were you born? at at least the state level, right? At the state level or the foreign country level. If you look at those numbers uh, and kind of uh, parse through them, it's clear that there are uh, three or four major kind of population sources. One of them would be, uh, in general, Anglo-Americans from the East Coast. So if we look at more detail of where people were Born. Um, one area was New England, mainly Connecticut. Another was the Mid Atlantic, so that's mainly Pennsylvania, especially southeast Pennsylvania. 
and the third was the South, and by the South I mean the first South, and that was Virginia, right? Um, a second uh, source of Ohio's early population was African Americans, um, mainly from the Upton South, so from Virginia and also Kentucky and Tennessee, and what's now West Virginia. They were settling mainly in southern Ohio. So these are, uh, uh, most of them uh, were uh, uh, free people because once they crossed the Ohio River, right, the Northwest Ordinance stipulated that the Northwest Territory was a uh, free territory. So um, many of these folks came uh, with uh, their former slave owners from Virginia, but once they got across the Ohio River, they were manumitted. Um, and so here I'm talking about really early African Americans. Um, so uh, not the, the, the people who were settling in places like, like in the industrial period, like in uh, Youngstown or Cleveland or Cincinnati. But I'm talking about in the 1820s, 1830s, or even earlier uh, in southern Ohio, uh, establishing uh, independent towns. A third major source of Ohio's early population was foreign immigrants. And most of those, about half to about six out of ten or so, were from German-speaking Europe. I don't say Germany because there was no such thing as Germany at this time, right? Germany is not a country until 1871 and 72. Uh, so um, uh, if you look at the numbers, right, so this is Ohio nativity, that's place of birth in 1850. What's really amazing is go down here to the totals, that in 1850 there were already almost two million people which is really spectacular because in 1790 there couldn't have been more than 10,000 people of European ancestry living in Western Ohio. But already in just 50 years or so, there are two million. So you can see six, almost seven out of 10 Ohioans in 1850 had already been born in Ohio. But of those not born in Ohio, this is what we get, right? So a significant number from Pennsylvania, from Virginia, from Connecticut, foreign immigrants, and then this uh, what was referred to on the censuses as the black population. Sometimes uh, this population, members of this, this group were um, stipulated or, or uh, in the census records, it's shown as an M for mulatto. And it turns out many of these early, this, uh, many members of this early black, uh, black population groups. Uh, were a lot of right, but who were a mixed uh, ethnic ancestry. More on that later. Okay, so if you look at the foreign born, um, uh, this is what we get. So uh, about 48% came from German speaking Europe, and then uh, Ireland was uh, next on the list, and then you have a smattering of other places, but primarily from Germany. Okay, this is the map of the new United States in 1783. Right? So in 1783, this is what the United States looks like. So the United States had just fought the Revolutionary War, and the Treaty of Paris signed uh, in that year um, uh, formally ceded from Great Britain to the new United States all of this territory basically east of the Mississippi River uh, and west of the Appalachians. Um, and, uh, but there were some issues with this that the federal government, the first two Congresses, spent a lot of their time dealing with. And that is, what are we going to do with all this land? Um, and there are a couple of problems with that. One, and you can see here, is that several of the states in the East claimed this territory by virtue of 17th century royal charters. Right? So, uh, literally, in that 17th century charter signed by James II, um, the colony of Massachusetts's western boundary was the Great Ocean of the West. That's the Pacific. Same for Connecticut. The same for Virginia, for Georgia, etc. So literally, legally, the western uh, Massachusetts went all the way across the continent. So the federal government had to figure out how to deal with this, right? So to make a very, very long story short, and a very convoluted story short, what happened is that the representatives from these states in Congress uh, made deals, basically, with the federal government that 
they will cede their claim to this territory in exchange for the cancellation of war debts, of revolutionary war debts. Now, two of those uh, states, uh, Massachusetts and Virginia, had very, very strong congressional delegations, and they were able to ask for even a little bit more. They said, we'll cede all of our territory all the way to the Pacific, but we want to reserve this little chunk of land uh, on the south shore of Lake Erie. Virginia said the same thing. We'll cede all this territory. In fact, Virginia claimed all the way in this red area, all the way up into what's not the end. Um, and uh, they said, okay, we'll cede that, uh, but we want to reserve a piece of land between the in Ohio and the, my, the little Miami and the side of the river. And in both cases, uh, those states were going to use that land to repatriate the payoff of <coughs> revolutionary war uh, bonds uh, that were owed to, uh, uh, to uh, soldiers. So if you were uh, in Virginia, if you were a general like George Washington, uh, and so, uh, you, were, uh, you received a patent for so many thousand acres of land in, uh, in Ohio in the Virginia military district. The other issue is that there are dozens and dozens of different indigenous tribes out here, right? The uh, the Chippewa <coughs> out here, the Winnebago, the on and on and on, right? Um, and so they claim this land as ancestral territory. So what's the answer there? What did the federal government eventually do? Uh, this was a violent, unfortunately, a violent <coughs> push, right? Uh, through chunked up treaties sometimes, uh, but uh, largely through violence, um, those tribes were pushed west, eventually all the way to Oklahoma, right? Um, and, um, uh, and so that was the answer, right? Unfortunately, the answer uh, that the federal government came in uh, with was how to deal with Native Americans was that they would have to leave. Uh, uh, and, and so that's a, you know, a sad uh, chapter. So one of the things we were really interested in is this interaction, right? And so we have several authors in our book uh, that uh, discuss this early interaction. And that's why I chose this, uh, this uh, uh, painting uh, as the cover of the book. It shows um, the negotiations between representatives of the different tribes. Uh, uh, paramount among them was Little Turtle, the Miami chief. Uh, so there he is. And he is negotiating with Mad Anthony Wayne, right? General Anthony Wayne, that's him right there. And one of his lieutenants, William Henry Harrison, the former or the future president, right? And what it really what's really interesting is it shows this guy here, his name was William Wells, he was a captain, and he is writing down what's going on. That means he knows we are me, right? He's the translator between the two parties. How did he know me? me? Well, he was this guy's son-in-law. He was really a son-in-law. He had married his daughter, right? Um, so this is telling, right? So this goes, this, this runs counter to this, to this, this narrative that I think we as Americans have been uh, kind of inculcated with. That oh, the Indians really didn't have much to do. They were kind of powerless, and they left. And no, they were actively negotiating, right? Uh, the, 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 the language of the treaty that they were going to sign, uh, and there was real interactions at the individual level, right? William Wells is proof of that. Um, uh, very, very early on, out here on the front. So the Treaty of Greenville was finally signed in August of 1795. Uh, this took place probably about three months earlier. Uh, and then uh, it was finally signed here. So here is uh, Tecumseh, uh, and there is um, uh, Anthony Wayne right there. And the, uh, the, the various about 12 different tribes uh, ceded basically uh, this area of Ohio to the federal government. That's the truth. Greenville Treaty Line of 1795. And then over time, um, uh, there were other treaties that were signed with other uh, tribes that eventually resulted in the cession of all of what's now in Ohio to the federal government. 
And when that occurred, those were usually referred to as the hundreds lands, um, uh, or sometimes it was referred to as the public domain, right? So owned by the federal government. This is the most interesting map, I think. Uh, I've got a big copy of it on my, uh, on my on the wall of my office because there's no other state in the country that has a map like this. Well, Texas kind of does as well because Texas also was settled by different, uh, a lot of different uh, ethnic groups. Um, but here you see the Connecticut Western Reserve, the Virginia Military District. Here's the Ohio Company purchase, right? One of the things the federal government tried to do uh, from the very beginning was to uh, uh, to sell this land, right? To recruit, um, you know, the federal government was broke uh, when, uh, uh, when, when uh, after the Treaty of Paris, and so it had a lot of land, though. That land in an agricultural society meant money, right? So one of the first things that the ideas that the federal government had was to um, sell pieces of the of the public domain to individual companies or even individual persons, uh, and uh, that's what the Ohio company was about, right? So that was basically a joint stock company formed in Boston, and their idea was they were going to form a new New England in the wilderness, right? We're going to bring democracy and republic and republican form of government out here to uh, to 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 the frontier, and they uh, established Marietta as their base of operations. Um, and, uh, uh, and establish right in the middle of that purchase a uh, place for a university, right? The first university, the Ohio University, uh, in Athens, named after that ancient city of Rome, right? Um, so um, uh, this map, if you look at that 1850 census, right, those, those numbers, well, if you look at this map, it's clear that uh, that. Uh, uh, that, that that had an effect on where people went when they settled in the state. So what I've done here is I have taken those census numbers at the township level, right? So all of these units here are civil townships. Um, and what I did is I colored each township a, a different color based upon the non-Ohio born population where they were. Right, so the non-Ohio born population in 1850, where were those not born in Ohio born? And it doesn't take a geographer to show, to realize that where did the New Englanders go when they settled in Ohio during this period? They went up here in the Connecticut Western Reserve. Where did Virginians go? Mainly in the Virginia military district and southern Ohio. Where did Pennsylvanians go? Almost everywhere else. Okay, so that's what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about, is take you into uh, these areas and show you how these, uh, how Ohio uh, evolved uh, different cultural landscapes as a result of these migrations. And so what I've done is I, uh, 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 using this idea of genealogical geography and that, that, that model that I showed, right, uh, using a root place, this is what uh, I've done with these Upland Southern uh, families. So what I've done is I chose uh, simply some families are random. These, this could be I've done for almost any family, I think, but I chose some families that uh, were rather important in the early settlement of the middle side of the valley around Chillicothe, which was the first capital of the state, right? Um, and uh, and uh, if you travel around in the rural area around there, these names keep showing up, like Rinnick Road and Van Meter Farm, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I looked at these families, and I looked at their, uh, their genealogies, and what I discovered is that this fits this model, right? So this early root place, this area of gathering, for these four families was this area in what's now the eastern hand of West Virginia. That's the south branch of the Potomac Valley in what's now Hardy County, West Virginia. Um, so all of these families had ultimately origins back in, uh, uh, in England, in the case of the Rennets, uh, in uh, uh, Ulster, in Northern Ireland, in the case of the McNeils, and in the Netherlands, in the case of the Van Meters. 
So like many other early Dutch settlers, they settled in the Hudson Valley of New York, but then over time gathered, if you will, over generations into this new place. Uh, and, uh, and then subsequent generations then moved west. And where did they go? To a new group place, a new gathering, and that was the side of the valley. So, oops. Could be this is a very good spot. Oh, yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah. So uh, this is Colby County. Um, and so the this is um, uh, the Potomac River is uh, right up here, right? That, that's the southern border of Maryland, the Maryland Panhandle. So this became an area uh, that a lot of these uh, uh, became an area that was a focus of uh, early uh, cattle husbandry. These families, the Linnets, the Van Meters, uh, Etc. They all settled in here and became uh, rather wealthy cattle farmers. And when they went further west, they brought that with them to the side of the valley. You know, a lot of the early movers and shakers in Ohio, uh, Ohio's uh, political histories were southerners. Really, Ohio was early on mostly a southern state. Uh, who were the early governors, uh, the legislators, uh, etc. So in that area of the middle side of the valley, you see a transplantation or an extension of that upland southern cultural landscape. Uh, so distinctive types of barns, distinctive types of houses, uh, etc. And here I've mapped out uh, these, uh, uh, these features in the landscape, right, in, uh, in Pickaway at Ross County. So this is just south of Columbus. So here's the silo. And uh, there were three main areas that were settled by these people from Hardy County. Uh, one was the, uh, 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 they called the Darby Bottoms uh, in the Darby Creek uh, Valley. Another was the Pickaway Plains uh, between Circleville and Chillicothe. And another area is called the High Bank. That's where the Van Meter family settled here. And they built these big mansions that they named. Remember, like, remember St. God in the Inn? What, what was Scarlett O'Hara's mansion named? Era, right? So these were the first settlers, right? That tradition, they named these uh, their, 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 their homes, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and you see this in this area of Ohio as well. So uh, these are these planter mansions uh, uh, of these, uh, the, these families. So here is High Bank Farm. Look at the date, 1796. Right? So this is very early. So the very earliest Ohioans of European ancestry and Indian ancestry were settlers. This is a really good example of an eye house. This is the very first house they built on the Van Meter farm. An eye house is simply a Georgian style house that is uh, uh, one room deep, but two or more rooms wide, and usually two stories high. It's the most common house in the colonial period. Uh, Virginians tended to build them with, this one doesn't have it, but Virginians tended to build them with a second story or a, a porch, covered porch, um, whereas Pennsylvanians, uh, they tend to look more like this. But really, that's a, 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 that's a style that was brought from England during the colonial period and made its way out into Ohio during this early federal period. Um, Distinctive settlement patterns. Um, if you look at um, the uh, in the Virginia military district, that part of Ohio, um, that area when people uh, established farmsteads, they surveyed those farmsteads using um, the type of survey system that had been used in the American East and uh, and back in Europe, and that is known as meets and bounds survey. So meets and bounds, a meet in the landscape is a um, physical feature, like maybe a big tree or a big rock or something like that, or a creek uh, or something. Uh, the, and then the bounds are straight lines drawn between those features. And when you do that, you get property boundaries that look like this. And the only place in Ohio you can find this is in, in the uh, 
uh, the Sire River Valley or the Virginia Military District. And this is what it looks like when you fly over, right? So uh, this is different, right, from almost everywhere else in Ohio and points west, right? When you fly over Nebraska at 30,000 feet and you look down, what's it look like? It's a big checkerboard, right? That's the federal public land survey system, which is based on a record figure survey. They didn't use that here, right? So you get this irregular survey. Um, Pennsylvania Germans settled in much of this central part of Ohio, and they came from a different area on this coast, a, a different kind of cultural part of the region, and that was the Mid-Atlantic or Southeast Pennsylvania. So if you, uh, here I'm looking at early settlers in uh, parts of Ross and, uh, I'm sorry, um, Perry and Fairfield County, centered on the, the town of Lancaster, which is just southeast of Columbus. That is only about 20 miles of the profile from the side of the valley. But the landscape is just 20 miles away from the side of the valley it looks very different. And that's because this was settled by Pennsylvania Germans, the so called Pennsylvania Dutch, who weren't Dutch at all, they were Deutsch, not as sort of Germans. And they had come from here. So here is this initial root place, this gathering, in this case, from Germany, from southwestern Germany, the Rhine and Pfalz area of the Upper Rhine Valley, to southeast Pennsylvania, beginning in, in around 1710 or so. And then there's a movement in, by about 1790, 1800, further west. And they settle in lots of areas in Ohio. I'll focus on this one right here. Uh, so this is a, a, a map, a, another a way of kind of looking at uh, and understanding where people are coming from. This is from uh, a, a county history, the county history of Fairfield County, written in uh, the uh, 1870s. It was very popular in the 1870s and 1880s in, in the Midwest for these uh, county histories and atlases to be published. And a lot of those county histories have biographical sketches of some of the earliest settlers. And they usually call them prominences. But you gotta be careful, what was a who was a prominence? What made you a prominent citizen? Money. You were wealthy, right? You had land, and you were probably male, right? Uh, as opposed to female. Uh, unless you happen to be a landowner and you were a woman. But if you look at those biographical sketches, so they're skewed, right? They're, they're skewed towards the wealthy, landholding elite and towards men. Knowing that, nevertheless, it's a way, another clue, right? So this is the places of birth of these prominent citizens in uh, the, the Fairfield County Atlas. And where is it? Yep, in this area of southern Pennsylvania, right? So they're coming from a different place than these southern southerners who are coming from down here. And they're bringing with them a different, I'm gonna skip that, a different, uh, 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 type of ways of building, uh, of, uh, of weighing off the land, uh, uh, of farming, etc. But probably the most conspicuous, distinctive part of that uh, landscape that was imported into Ohio from southeast Pennsylvania was the uh, Pennsylvania barn. Sometimes they're called a, a, a four bay barn or a bank barn. So you've probably already seen examples of these. Uh, they uh, are um, uh, two-story, and they're very, very large. They were usually the first thing that was built by these farmers. The house was built second, because the farming system they brought with them was uh, quite extensive, commercially oriented, and it was based upon growing uh, both crops and raising livestock, mainly dairy cattle. So you needed a barn that was big enough to do both, right, to store your, or to, to keep your hay and grain dry out of the weather, but also a place where you could milk your cat. And that's what the Pennsylvania barn is. And uh, the, the leading scholar of that barn traces its origin back to eastern Switzerland in the 17th century. Um, I've mapped out where, in, in this small place, uh, this one area where these Pennsylvania Germans settled in Ohio, I've mapped out about 85 examples of these types of barns. And that's the this area is the densest, uh, uh, the densest uh, concentration of these types of barns outside of Southeast Pennsylvania. 
This is uh, an area just to uh, just to the west of, of uh, Lancaster. This is the type of uh, environment, natural environment they settled in, which is very much like Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, this is right on the glacial uh, divide in Ohio. I'm standing on top of this all this this uh, this glacial moraine, right? So. 12,000 years ago, the last week, at the end of the last glacial epoch, if you were standing here, you would have been looking to the north and west, and there would have been a sheet of ice 5,000 feet thick, a mile thick, right? And this would have been the vast outwash plain. And as the climate changed and warmed uh, about 12,000 years ago, those glaciers began to melt back toward the poles, and they left behind all of the stuff that was in the glacier soil and rocks. And uh, trees and all this stuff that had been ground up uh, from the weight of this uh, glacier and it deposited it in much of the American Midwest, making it one of the most edible to reproductive regions in the, in the world. And that's what these Pennsylvania German farmers were after. They were farmers, right? And they were dairy, dairy, dairymen primarily. And they needed lots of corn land because that's what they were feeding to their cattle. And these are the types of barns they built, right? Very different from the types of barns you find in the side of the valley, which are rather small because a barn in the, the Virginia uh, uh, way of doing things was rather small. It was only a place or uh, it was a structure that was only meant to keep your grain and hay dry. It wasn't a place where animals lived. Um, that's the, in, in the English tradition. But in the Germanic tradition, a barn is a place where not only do you store your hay up here at the top and your grain and cribs that are in here, but also it's a place for the animals to live. In this case, cattle. So there are about 85 examples of this. Uh, this is the distribution of that type of barn. The origin was here in Southeast Pennsylvania, where these Pennsylvania Germans are. And you find it wherever Pennsylvania Germans settled. So if you ever come across one of those barns in the landscape, it's a pretty good bet that uh, the, the, the person who built that was a Pennsylvania German ancestry. Not 100%, not but it's a pretty good bet. And this is this area I'm looking at here in this part of the fire. Really, really interesting landscapes, right? Um, uh, this is the uh, barn that unfortunately has been torn down now. Uh, but when I took this picture uh, about uh, 15 years ago, it was still in really good shape. And this is an inset of this, this uh, 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 that's here on the, the Gable Inn, and you can see the date, 1819, right? So really early, that's a very hard core, but he didn't have enough space to uh, uh, put his full name, September 22nd, 1819. But look at, the, look at the motifs here. There's this heart. That's this ancient Teutonic heart that goes way back in, in German history. And this uh, uh, motif, which is a uh, sun swirl, uh, that's a swastika, right? Unfortunately, that was made into something different by the Nazi regime. But that's an ancient symbol that actually goes all the way back to ancient India. It's basically a, a symbol, a symbol of the sun. Um, and you find these elements on the in the landscape on uh, gravestones. Uh, they they put those those uh, things on like uh, Bibles and uh, death certificates and uh, birth certificates and. Uh, uh, baptismal certificates and all things like that. And that's probably this the Pennsylvania Germans brought with them this really um, uh, distinctive folk culture that used a lot of color and used a lot of these images. These images. Um, here's another example of one of these barns. Uh, they also uh, uh, built um, uh, uh, brick eye houses, but uh, they, uh, they're a little different than the Virginia eye houses. Um, uh, because they don't have a second story uh, porch. And they also tended to begin out here in Ohio putting kind of a new uh, stylings on them. Uh, and that's why these are called federal. This is called federal styling. That's this, like these, these uh, uh, stone lintels over the windows and the, on, on the doors here, and these fans. These are, this was very popular during, uh, in the United States during this period. So here's another good example. This is in New Reading, named after Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, just down the road from Somerset, named after Somerset, Pennsylvania, uh, where the people who settled that area came from. Uh, these folks were mainly 
um, uh, Lutheran and uh, German reform. Some were members of the uh, Pietist sense, like the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, the Schumfelders, the Dunkers, uh, etc. But most were Lutherans and German reform. Uh, and uh, throughout this area of Ohio, uh, that landscape reflects that, right? This is an evangelical Lutheran church just out in the middle of nowhere, out in the, the rural countryside. They're almost always associated with a cemetery. Here's uh, the little town of Hallsville, which is actually only about 10 miles from uh, uh, Stoppelville to the east. Um, and I don't know if you can read here, it says Hallsville EUB Church. EUB stands for Evangelical United Brethren, which is a denomination that doesn't exist anymore because they merged with the Methodist Church to form the United Methodist Church in 1964. Um, but here it is, still in the landscape, right? That re uh, reflects that. Uh, and you go to the cemeteries in little towns and you can find some amazing things. There's Wilhelm Betzer, who certainly probably spoke German as his first language. I don't think he would have been buried uh, with a German gravestone if he didn't. And you find these symbols, if you look hard enough. There's that sun scroll symbol again, and this kind of uh, this flower symbol that you see among the Pennsylvania Germans as well. Now here, um, uh, much of Ohio uh, was settled um, uh, uh, within the township range uh, rectilinear public service system, which began actually just north of here, uh, just up uh, where um, uh, the uh, on the Pennsylvania Ohio border, right at the top of where West Virginia curves, right that curve where it's the the, the Western Panhandle uh, starts. There's that's where the grid began in 1785. That was the first, uh, uh, what's called an initial point. Um, and so in Metro Ohio, uh, and almost everywhere west of Ohio, um, every state is laid out in that uh, a survey using that rectilinear uh, form. Um, one of the things that made its way uh, into Ohio was uh, uh, this way of laying out towns based upon the early antecedent of Philadelphia. And that's what's called a Philadelphia Square, or sometimes it's called a Lancaster Square, named after Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And basically, it's the idea of take, you're taking a, the, the a public open square out of four adjoining blocks. And usually, in the middle of the, uh, these, there's a, like a war memorial or, uh, or a statue of a fa the favorite son of the town or something like that. And that's based upon Philadelphia, drawn by William Penn, right? So it's 1683. So Somerset uh, is a good example of this, right? This is the town square. It's not a square. It's kind of a roundabout, right? And there's William Sheridan, who was a Civil War general from Somerset. This was the first uh, um, courthouse of Perry County before it moved south to another town. But here you can see that piece of the, the Central Square taken out of, of, out of a piece of uh, the Northern Square. And there are about 25, I've counted, examples of this in Ohio. This is not a then Okay, so where did New Englander set it? Right up here in the Northeast in the Western Reserve. So I looked at this area around Talmadge, which was the, one of the earliest settled towns in uh, the Connecticut Western Reserve. And Talmadge uh, was a uh, gathering point for several uh, families from the little town of uh, uh, a little town in northwest Connecticut uh, called Litchfield. This is where Litchfield is. And Litchfield is your prototypical New England town laid out on a village green with the Congregational Church right on that green. Uh, and so uh, in the Western Reserve of Ohio, you can find a New England landscape. Right, of distinctive types of houses like a salt box house or Cape Cod forms. If you ever go to Hale Farm Village uh, in Cuyahoga Valley National Park, that's kind of an outdoor museum uh, that has some of these examples. That's what I mean by Puff Light and Green. Uh, that's what I mean by a salt box house. Um, and then lots of uh, congregational churches, which of course is now the United Church of Christ. So here, uh, so, the, so in that uh, region, you see a lot of landscapes. This. 
right? So this is the first congregational church of, uh, of Talmadge, uh, and the first one built in Ohio. This looks just like the one in Richfield, Connecticut. Um, and every once in a while, if you go into the, uh, the graveyards there, you'll find some examples of these really distinctive New England forms. Uh, this is the only one I found in the Talmadge area of this colonial type of uh, gravestone. So here you see this uh, winged effigy, right? That's a soul effigy. That's the soul of the departed flying up to heaven. And there's the eye of God, right? And he's watching over that, uh, that soul. Um, so the settlement pattern there is laid out in towns and villages, right? A town. Uh, in the New England sense, is what we mean by a township here. A village is what we would mean that, by a town. And they still refer to those in, uh, in New England. Someone will say, I'm from such and such town. And they, what they mean is, I'm from kind of this township, even maybe an area of the side of Calvary. And, uh, and lots of these green villages. So this is this area of Northeast Ohio, uh, mapped out these villages with a central green. Um, this is the original survey of the Connecticut Western Reserve. So the Western Reserve is also surveyed in a rectilinear fashion, but it's not the same as the federal survey, the Township Range Survey. It's 25 square mile townships instead of 36 square mile townships. Uh, so that was used by the Connecticut Land but this is very typical. Here's Talmadge uh, uh, from an early map, and you can see that green. Right? This is very typical of, the, of, of New England villages, of where you have a central green, and then you have these radiating uh, spokes of uh, wheel, uh, roads, like uh, spokes of a wheel radiating out from them. So that's what Talmadge looks like, right? There's the, the congregational church on Talmadge Green. This is Milan in the Firelands uh, over by South of Sandusky. Uh, so there's this open space, right? A lot of them are kind of oval shaped. African Americans, they are settling in the state as early as the 18 teens, mainly in the southern part of the state. Uh, and they are gathering into these new places, these new towns, from a variety of places, mainly from uh, 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 Virginia, but also from what's now West Virginia. And settling in uh, small towns and groups of small towns. Uh, so in southern Ohio, uh, there are two or three major ones. Uh, I'll kind of focus on this one, this one in the north and east of Athens, centered on a little town uh, called Kilbert. Uh, it's also locally known as Tabor Town, named after the early uh, first settler there. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Tablers had come originally from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from Virginia, from the area just outside Richmond, but came through this area of central, what's now West Virginia, and then made their way into southern Ohio. The landscape in these rural areas where this, this, the, these African American and multi-ethnic populations settled um, is, is mainly a religious landscape of churches, the specific types of denominations, the AME, that's African Methodist Episcopal, uh, Baptist, of course, but also the Church of God, uh, a distinctive um, uh, uh, kind of a Pentecostal holiness uh, movement uh, that is uh, uh, very common in these, uh, these towns. Also, uh, distinctive cemeteries, um, and also heritage memorial landscapes, right? Uh, like underground railroad sites, um, historical genealogical societies. So here's an example. This is this little town of Kilbert, uh, uh, initially known as Taylor Town. And here's the Church of God. Uh, this was built in 1946, but the settlement goes back to the 1820s, uh, when Michael Taylor, who was a the son of a, a slave owner, a large son of a slave owner outside of Richmond, um, fell in love with uh, the, uh, uh, one of his father's slaves um, and uh, had three children with her. And he was, uh, was basically uh, kicked out of the, the family plantation and made his way to Wheeling. And in Wheeling, he purchased his wife and his three children's uh, 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 freedom. And they were 
maybe they didn't, and he looked for some land to settle in Ohio, and he found this area in what's now Northeast Athens County, and their ancestors live there to this day. And they are mixed and a mixed ancestry. They count all of these families count uh, 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 obviously African as, as, as part of their ancestry, uh, European, Anglo as part of their ancestry, and also indigenous Indian. Uh, many of them have Cherokee ancestry, which goes back to the Carolinas. That's a really fascinating uh, history. Here's the grave of Michael Taylor. This is the, 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 the man that. Uh, uh, came from Virginia with his uh, his, his wife uh, Hannah. We don't know her last name, and it was Taylor, but we don't know uh, uh, what originally it was from any And then this is common in these uh, cemeteries as well are, are kind of uh, handmade uh, gravestones, they're very distinctive. Distinctive names Taylor, uh, you see here, Goins. Goins, whenever you see the, the word Goins, that's a good. Uh, most uh, people named Goins in the United States came from far western Virginia, from Wise County, Virginia. Not all, but most. And the Goins are of this mixed uh, uh, ancestry. This is the Carmel settlement, all that remains of it. This was an early African American uh, settlement in uh, Highland County, Ohio. There's a cemetery there. You can see one of these kind of homemade graves. This is all that uh, remains today. But we have historical markers right, that, uh, that uh, uh, show this. Um, the, there's even some archaeology that's being done uh, uh, in, um, uh, in some of these places. This is uh, Hannibal Turner, James Hannibal Turner, uh, who um, was uh, uh, born a slave in, uh, outside of Richmond, Virginia, and came to Ohio in the uh, 1830s as a, as, a young, as a child. Uh, and this is a picture of him. Uh, taken in 1880. This is uh, the Multicultural Genealogical Heritage Center in Chesterville, which is just north of uh, Kilbert. Uh, they have a very active historical society, uh, and this is uh, uh, where they, uh, they have uh, their activities going on. And I will finish up with the final kind of piece of this early Ohio puzzle, and that is immigrants. Again, from uh, Germany, mainly. These are not to be confused with the Pennsylvania Germans, right? The Pennsylvania Germans are the, the uh, people who, the ancestors of people who came in the 1710s and 1720s into the Pennsylvania and the colonial period. These are immigrants that are coming around the 1830s, 1840s. So a new group of immigrants, larger in number, some 7 million of them over about a 100 year period, and one of the first areas that those new German immigrants settled is in Ohio, in western Ohio especially. And I'm going to focus on this area here uh, in um, uh, parts of all the ways and Mercer County. So this is all Blaze County, the 1850 census, the origin of the foreign born. And you can see that there's clustering uh, ethnic wise, right, in, Ger in the German township. Most of the people were born. German, right? Uh, so uh, uh, if you look at their kind of gathering map, what's missing on this map from the other maps? Yeah, there's yeah, there are no arrows, are there? And that's because these folks came directly from Germany, right? They didn't, I mean, obviously they, they had to land somewhere, probably in Baltimore at this time, uh, maybe New York, but probably Baltimore. Uh, and they went from there directly back here, right? They didn't, they didn't hang around. So there's this gathering, this time across thousands of miles of water and land, to this very rural area in western Ohio, beginning in the 1830s. Oops. And these folks, if you look at where they came from, if you look at their genealogy, they came, almost all of them, that settled in three little towns in, in our Blaze and Mercer counties came from a very specific village in Germany, in German speaking Europe. So this is present day Germany. This is the county of Steinfurt. And most of these families came from this little town called Ludwig. And they came from a, 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 this is another example of selective migration, right? So they're coming 
from a very specific place and going to a very specific place. And the connections are biological and kinship. Why are people going from here to Marshall County, Ohio? Because they knew someone here. My grandpa had moved there, or our uncle had moved there, or our cousin. And so they knew that if they could go from here, get across to, uh, to uh, North America, they could become landowners, which is something they could never do here, because the vast majority of the, these folks were poor peasants, uh, uh, part of the landless peasantry. They also came from an area that had a very distinctive folk culture, with very distinctive names. Look at these names. Have you ever heard of a German name, Kutterheimer? Or Auf den Hall, or Untin, or Cook, Smith Camp, Struva, Shopping Horse. Right? These are names that are only found in this part of the world, almost exclusively. And they settled in this area uh, of, uh, of, of far western Ohio. They originally came to Cincinnati. And when land opened up in this area, when the Ohio Erie Canal was being built, um, they decided to purchase some of the land along the Ohio Erie Canal because they believed it was going to be opened up. It was financial investment. But these, uh, this part of Germany that they so came from is also not unified in terms of religion and religious affiliation. Some were Catholic, some were Protestant, you know, Lutheran. And some were German Reformed. And so in Cincinnati, they formed societies based on confession to establish three separate towns here. And this is, I won't say this is unique in German immigration history in the United States, but very rare. Very rare. So the little town of New Knoxville was formed as the German Reformed town. So the German Reformed who lived in Cincinnati had come from this town of Lodgergen, moved up to New Knoxville, and they were around it. The Catholics went to Minster, and the Lutherans went to New Bremen. And to this day, those three towns are distinctive in terms of religious affiliation. So that cultural landscape and that part of, 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 of Ohio, that German immigrant cultural landscape, is again largely religious. Um, they call this area the land of cross pit churches. It's because there's so many big churches. This is Minster. There's an old uh, 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 you know, church from the 18, probably from the 1850s. You can right hear this today. Right? A big Catholic church. Here's New Knoxville. And then this church is now, uh, this, this was a German Reform church. Now it's a non denominational church. Here's Kader Heinrich Chevrolet. I remember the very first time I came, I, I went here, I knew when I saw that word Kader Heinrich, that name, I knew where these folks came from. Because I had studied German immigrants in my, for my dissertation in Missouri. They came from five miles down the road. And they also had these weird names, like these names like Brink Meyer, right? Brink Meyer. Uh, Meyer is an old word, German word for farmer, and Brink means the same thing in German as it does in English, the kind of outside. Right? So, Brink Meyer was a farmer who was literally on the outskirts of the town, but also on the outskirts of society. Right? Kader Heinrich, this, uh, in, uh, remember that uh, uh, in, in, in Germany that would have been spelled K O with a U lot. P-T-E-R. So, Kutter. A Kutter is an old general word for a cottager. That's a landless peasant. So, this was Henry's peasant. Henry's peasant. So, the peasant of Henry. And that's how surnames began in this part of, of Germany. So, this gets transplanted, right? So, you're not going to find in many other places in the United States that name. Right? So, here, in this case, it's pretty easy if you're a genealogist to trace this name. This is the little town of Cartagena uh, in Marshall County. And just down the road, there's a seminary. Look at that. And in the little town of Mariastein, 
there is an actual convent and a relic, a relic chapel. Right? You know what a relic chapel is? Like that's kind of it's an official place of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, where they store relics of the saints, right? Like under glass here. So here is you know, like the fingernail of Saint Joseph. Or here's a you know a, a drop of blood of Saint such and such. Locked in a clear from Saint such and such. And there was these are put all over the world, right? And, and there's one in Ohio. Out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it literally it's not a town. It's just out in the middle of a cornfield. Um, it's really really fascinating. So very distinctive cultural landscape uh, formed by these German immigrants. Yeah. So there you have it. You've got uh, these um, uh, all all of these different groups settling in Ohio during this early period, 1790 to 1850, in distinctive parts of the state, each bringing with them distinctive ways of building, distinctive uh, uh, ways of uh, you know, building a house, of laying out land, of farming, and such. And that has lasted to the, the current day. Uh, and, and it makes Ohio, again, very so unique, but very distinct in the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Um, I wish I had more books. Uh, I, I got cleaned out in my last uh, talk in, in uh, Westerville uh, last week. Uh, I had a bunch of books, and uh, I don't have any more. So I'm sorry I don't have any more of these. But um, uh, if you want to purchase a book, it's available on Amazon, uh, and also directly from Ohio University Press. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, uh, and the there we go. Thank you very much for coming up from Athens. Uh, you know, interesting that you talked that came to the country. Uh, the 11th governor of the state of Ohio almost wasn't because he was involved in an Indian skirmish here in Belmont County in 1795. So as late as 1795, there were many folks who didn't move into Belmont County. They actually already owned the land, uh, but they didn't move here because of the uh, possibility that they lose their scalp. And this, this battle actually took place in Bel Air at Indian Run, just a mile up by the Dairy Queen, where the Dairy Queen's located. Yeah, the same thing happened up in the, the Western Reserve as well. So, uh, like Talmadge, uh, the, 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 the man who that town was named after, Benjamin Talmadge, uh, bought land, that land, sight and scene, from the Danica Land Company, and never even got it. So he has a town in Ohio named after him, but he never even lived there. So these folks uh, that moved into Ohio, they were uh, they were pretty tough people. Um, we're going to have you draw the uh, the tickets for this is for the uh, this is for the door prize. So okay. if you could draw one of those numbers, okay, that is six six one zero one nine six 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 one zero one nine six. Here we go, Rita. Very good. Okay, Rita, you can go to the uh, desk there, and they'll give you uh, the door prize. And then the last one is for a charcuterie board and a hat. Great son, buy that hat and a charcuterie board. Okay, this one is nine five three two six five zero. Nine five three two six five zero. Right here in the front row. Very good. Congratulations. Okay, we want to thank you all for coming this evening. I hope to see you all next week. Uh, I'm going to be doing the presentation next week, and so I hope to see you all back again. Thank you once again, Tim, for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you all.